Hey everyone, today we're going to rank Fire Emblem games based on how good they are as recommendations for a new player. So if you or a friend is trying to figure out where to start in the Fire Emblem series, this could be a handy list to reference. At Mecha, I've played all these games from start to finish. I started with Fire Emblem 7 personally, uh, but I think I have a reasonable grasp, a couple of good criteria to figure out which of these games are good to start with. I made four that I'm gonna go over real quick. First of all is that it needs to have some kind of tutorial to get someone into things. Fire Emblem is a complicated game when you're new to it. It has a lot of numbers. Uh, the battle forecast to us veteran players makes a lot of sense, but when you're new to it, all you see is a bunch of numbers and things you don't know what it means. So the game needs to guide you a little bit into it. And I think an in-game tutorial is the best way to do that. Uh, number two, the game and the mechanics have to be representative of the rest of the series. The more a game deviates, and Fire Emblem deviates a lot from its formula every now and then, uh, so the more it deviates, uh, the worse I think it is as a recommendation because I don't want people to just try out one Fire Emblem game, I want them to get sucked into the series and really enjoy it. So uh, if a game is very different, if it's experimental, I think that's good for the series to try and broaden it, but I think it's bad for beginners uh, as a first game to try. And there are plenty of games that don't do that. Number three, the story needs to be understandable and fun for a new player. You, don't, you shouldn't have to play a different Fire Emblem game first, for, to understand your first Fire Emblem game. That makes absolutely no sense. So no sequels, no midquels, no prequels. Uh, the game needs to stand on its own, uh, generally speaking. There's going to be exceptions to this, of course, exceptions to all of this, um, but there you go. It needs to be understandable. I think that's pretty clear. Uh, number four, the game needs to have aged well. If it's a really old Fire Emblem game, it better be real damn good for me to give it a good recommendation, because if your first Fire Emblem game is not fun to play in the year 2023, or whatever year you're listening to this to, or watching this on, then you're not going to have a good time, you're not going to enjoy the rest of the series. Uh, so even though a game might have good objective quality for its time, like if it was really ahead of its time, that's great. Put it in a museum, but don't recommend it to a new player. Uh, that's why I'm not going to rank the early game very high in these. The early games, there, there's multiple of these. So that's really important. Uh, I'm just going to, I'm probably going to mention this a couple times, but this list is not indicative of the quality of a game in, in general in any sort of way. Uh, it's really just would I recommend this to a new player, and that's a very different ball game from how much I enjoy the game or how much you enjoy your game. So I'm going to rank a couple of my favorites really low. I'm going to rank a couple of games that I don't like that much very high because I'm using these criteria, not the criteria I usually use to judge Fire Emblem games by. That said, let's get into things. So to no one's surprise, probably I'm going to rank FE1 very low for the reason that it hasn't aged very well. If you're giving this someone to someone new to the series, they're going to watch Marth move like five miles an hour. Uh, or five paces an hour or whatever you want to call it and they're gonna be like damn this is boring I'm gonna play something else instead something with slightly faster pacing that I wouldn't fall asleep to uh, The game is good in the sense that it's very representative of the rest of the series even though it was the very first one uh, Stuff like you know inventory management. Well, it's not the exact same but the, the trading system is very reminiscent of what you have nowadays um, the character setup, like the classes you get, uh, the weapons they use. Sure, the weapon triangle is missing, but I don't think that's a very big deal for the series overall. There's a lot of games with no weapon triangle or a more limited weapon triangle. I think that's fine. I think you can generally give this game to someone and afterwards they'll have a very reasonable grasp of the rest of the series, uh, but it'll have taken them five years to get there. So I don't think this is a very good game to start with. Uh, it is a fun game to explore if you enjoy like really retro games, like if you know someone who's like really into super old games and they don't mind the, the NES uh, clunkiness, then sure it's fine, but I think that doesn't go for most people. For the same reason, I can't really recommend Gaiden. Also because Gaiden, I think, kind of fails on the representative aspect. I think it doesn't do a very good job of conveying some important farming mechanics. Uh, specifically, the fact that everyone can only have one item and all items have infinite durability it's really a big part of Fire Emblem, I think, that units can have multiple items, uh, weapons, and, you know, usable items, vulnerabilities, and stuff on them. I think that management is a big part of what makes Fire Emblem Fire Emblem. And also, it doesn't feel like... There's a lot of differences from, like, normal Fire Emblem games. Usually a Fire Emblem map chapter is, like, solid design. It's, like, treasure to get and uh, places to go to, choke points to stop, enemy thieves to stop from taking your treasure, uh, recruitable characters. And kind of doesn't really have that. Uh, it's generally just you have your army plopped in somewhere and you have the enemy army that's just kind of all over the place and they just come at you, you have to route them all. That's all there is to it. That's some Fire Emblem, but I don't think that's core Fire Emblem. Uh, also, the, the world map in general 
uh, it doesn't really feel like a Fire Emblem game in that sense. I know later games have world maps sometimes, uh, but it feels... I also like to compare it to like Super Mario or something, where you're just going across the land playing like one level at a time. Uh, it's a fun way to do Fire Emblem, but I, I think Fire Emblem is most represented by like you go from one chapter to the next chapter uh, with some story in between, and that's it. The game just keeps you constantly engaged. It's really hard to explain, but I hope you understand why the vibe of Gaiden, I think, is very different uh, from most Fire Emblem games. And even though I enjoy that vibe personally, I wouldn't recommend it as a first time, just to make sure that someone, you know, really gets Fire Emblem uh, the way that most Fire Emblem games are. Uh, then we have Mystery of the Emblem. I'm gonna rank this one a little higher than most old games, because, uh, like I said, the Marth games are very representative gameplay-wise, and this one is a strict upgrade from FE1 in almost every way. Uh, it feels better to play, but not better by enough that I would rank it much higher. I still, it still hasn't aged that well, and I think the remakes overall do a better job of introducing someone to the series without turning them off from the clunkiness. Um, this game is very popular in Japan. Uh, similarly, FE1 was very popular in Japan when it came out, obviously. Uh, the, game, the series wouldn't have gotten where it is today if it wasn't for FE1. But that's not what we're ranking here. What we're ranking here is someone comes up to you in current year, 2023 or whatever, and says, hey, I want to get into Fire Emblem, what game should I start with? Do you tell them FE3? Um, probably no. They, they could be worse off, but I think they also could be much better off. So that's where FE3 goes. Genealogy, uh, a game that I think is most people know is not going to make it just based on uh, how representative it is based on the rest of the series. The first thing you have to do when you get someone into genealogy from another Fire Emblem game is explain all the things that work differently. Stuff like their pursuit skill, the fact that you need that skill to double attack as opposed to some kind of attack speed threshold. Um, the part where weapons can no longer be traded freely but instead have to be, you know, sold to the pawn shop and then bought again. Uh, the fact that they have a kill tracker to figure out whether a weapon can critical or not. Um, the inheritance system, maybe, uh, the way villages work, it's all so different from everything else that I don't think it makes sense to start with genealogy. There are people who started with genealogy and it worked out fine. The other part with genealogy and these older games that I didn't mention yet is that there's no tutorial. Of course, that was probably because these games came with instruction manuals, or in the case of Thrace, I think there's like a VHS tape you could put in to figure out how the game works, uh, if you got the right version, that is. Um, these are great for introducing you to things if you like reading those kind of things. Uh, but I think nowadays it's better if the game itself teaches you how to play. And Genealogy, it has a couple of villages that tell you how stuff works. But at the beginning you're just given a story and then you just start with Sigurd and his knights. And it's just like, alright, go nuts and try stuff out. And some people enjoy that, but I think nowadays most people would like a tutorial. And that's why I've written a, uh, I think a blind player guide for FE4. Uh, I think I posted it on the Fire Emblem subreddit a long time ago. Um, because I think most people are going to appreciate that than more than trying to figure it out on their feet. So that's why genealogy is not going to rank very high. I'm going to rank it like below FE3 uh, for this. Again, it's nothing to do with the quality of the game. Uh, Thracia is, well, first of all, it's, just, it's a mid call to genealogy, so you don't really understand what the hell is going on. You probably could get away with playing it story-wise if you're okay with getting spoiled for a future FE4 playthrough, because the opening of FE5 like the opening scroll when you start up the game, I think it spoils FE4 for you. So I would never recommend someone open this game unless they've at least played the first generation of uh, FE4. So uh, don't start with Thracia for that reason alone. In addition, it is more like the modern games than someone like Gaiden or Genealogy in the sense that the maps are a bit smaller. Um, it's, you know, the, the army versus big group of enemies. Uh, but you have like battle preparations and stuff. It's, it's really hard to explain, but uh, then again, it also has a lot of deviations from Fire Emblem, like capturing and the way the build stat works, uh, movement growth that are never seen again. Uh, fatigue is a very big one that has never been seen again in the way that was in, in Thracia. So uh, I think those differences do disqualify it as a good first game very easily. Uh, I will, I would honestly put it below FE1 for that reason, <laughs> uh, because there's this. It fails every single um, criterion that I have, really. <laughs> Except like the age well thing, I think it had age well, but maybe not enough for most people. I think some people would still find it old and annoying to play. It does have some menu clunkiness still. Not as much as the NES games, but it still has some SNES clunkiness. The first game that I think is acceptable to recommend to new players, not great, but uh, acceptable, is uh, The Binding Blade, FE6. Um, 
not just because it has Roy in it, who is in Smash Bros and everything, but also it has a tutorial. It's a little bit hidden. It's the one where you have Roy and I think Walt shows up and Cecilia. Uh, most people will probably just start the game and go from there. Uh, and that's not really a tutorial with integrated within the game, but it has one. Uh, the game and the mechanics are very representative of the series as a whole. Uh, what Binding Blade looks like is basically what the rest of the series looks like when it comes to ooh, item management, the way menus work, the battle forecasts, uh, doubling mechanics, rescue dropping, uh, all that stuff. It's all in there. So that works very, very well. And, you know, the game is just solid. The only reason I'm not putting it higher is because Binding Blade is a little harder than most games are. Uh, in normal mode, I I personally, when I replayed normal mode a while ago, I didn't find it too bad. I was actually like, damn, for someone who used to hard mode, this is laughably easy. But I know I've seen newer players struggle with FV6 the first time. Uh, I do believe it still has ambush spawns, which are a very big problem. Uh, to be honest, most games down here have ambush spawns. I didn't really mention them yet, but I think those are very unfriendly to new players. Binding Blade also has that good ending problem, where unless you do very specific things, keep very specific characters alive, uh, bring specific characters to recruit other specific characters, uh, you're gonna miss out on the good ending the first time around. That might give you some replay value, but it also probably makes you feel a bit empty when you first beat the game. And then the guiding chapters themselves uh, just feel like a bit of a slog. I think Binding Blade is better enjoyed when you're more acquainted with the series and you're willing to look into a game a little bit more before playing it for your first time and you just kind of see it as completing a quest for yourself, like, I've got to get this thing, got to get this thing. Like, there's a lot of joy to be had in playing games blind, generally speaking, but I think there's also some joy in playing a game while constantly checking a guide. Not the, not the annoyance of checking the guide, but uh, I think it's kind of like using a treasure map to find a treasure. That's the, how I would compare playing The Binding Blade for the first time with a bit of a guide. It's kind of like how I enjoyed uh, the spin-off Tearing Saga, for example. It's just having someone there to help me guide through it. I think that makes the best experience for Binding Blade. And there's a different enjoyment to be had compared to play playing blind. I know it sounds silly because it sounds like a hassle to have to look everything up, uh, but I think that can be a fun experience sometimes, but I wouldn't put Binding Blade any higher than this. It's a fine game to start with if you're really low on options, but you probably aren't because this game is Japanese only. So you have to get a translation patch and everything if you want to play it in English. So uh, that's Binding Blade. It is connected in story to FE7. I don't think it makes a super big difference whether you play FE6 or FE7 first because FE6 uh, is the original story and FE7 is a prequel, but they're both written in a way where a new player can understand what's going on. And if they play the other game, they'll get the references. So I don't think it makes a super big difference which one you play first. Uh, I probably would recommend the Blazing Blade first before the Binding Blade. Uh, by a little bit, but that's just the order that I experienced them in, so I'm actually not sure if that's the best way. The Japanese people, uh, they had it the other way around, and they're probably fine with either order, probably. I didn't ask them all, <laughs> but you know what I mean, right? It's probably fine to play either of them first, story-wise. And the game has aged pretty well. Uh, obviously, it's not the most polished version of the GBA games, but it's pretty solid in most respects. Uh, Blazing Blade is like a polished version of FE6 in most aspects. I think it's no surprise to see them kind of rank this in S tier. Yes, I know I've I've raved on the story. Uh, I've like gave it a pretty bad reputation over the years with the with the video series about it. Uh, but for a first time, where you're not going to notice the issues with it, you're just going to have fun with it, uh, and it's perfectly understandable and fun for a new player. The story is good enough for a new player. Uh, it has a very long tutorial that most veteran players hate. So that's why I, that's kind of one of the reasons I want to recommend it first. Because if you play it first, you're not going to really get annoyed by the tutorials. In fact, the way I played this game the first time, I got through all the tutorials while still screwing up horribly, like I didn't take in any of the lessons that the game gave me. Uh, I had a reverse idea of what the weapon triangle was, for example, because I was stupid and didn't read the numbers. So the tutorial did not bother me when I first played it. There's also very little uh, reason not to introduce someone to the series with like the Lin tutorial, with like Lin's animations. I think almost everyone got hooked on Fireman when they first played Debbie 7 uh, That game is just for almost everyone, I would say, to at least try a little bit first. Um, it's super great. It has aged super well. All the GBA animations have. Um, the story, like I said, it doesn't really matter that much whether you play FE6 or FE7 first. I'd recommend FE7 first by a slight margin, but it doesn't matter all that much. And the game teaches you not everything you need to know in the first 10 chapters, but it teaches you enough to get going. And even then, even if you suck at the tutorial, you can still learn your lessons in the Hollywood mode part of the game. Uh, the game doesn't really hold your hand per se at that point, but it does still every now and then introduce you to something new. 
Uh, think of like the magic triangle is like mentioned in the tutorial message somewhere in chapter 17 or 16 or something. So there is quite a bit to learn in Fireman. FE7 I think pro provides like an okay environment to do all that while still giving you a good experience overall. Sacred Stones, I think it's like an improved version almost for tutorials for like, not for newer players. And this is a tutorial that's less annoying for new players because instead of having this Lin mode tutorial, what they have instead is uh, the tutorials integrated into the chapters that are already there. So the first eight chapters or so introduce you to all kinds of concepts more naturally, like it's just better integrated with the rest of the experience. Uh, stuff like trading, rescuing, uh, it's just right there in a chapter that's also just fun to play if you're not looking for tutorial. And all these are just on easy mode, so if you play on normal mode or hard mode, you won't need to get bothered with tutorials. But again, we're assuming new players, we're assuming they're playing on a difficulty that gives them some tutorials, and in that case, Sacred Stones is absolutely great. I'm not sure whether to put it over FE7 or FE8. It's uh, I'm not sure which of these to rank higher, uh, but the fact that the story stands on its own, uh, the fact that it's still a GBA game that has aged very well, I think that just qualified as a really good game. I will bring up that it has the world map, uh, which has like grinding, which I think is not a great thing to give to players uh, for first times because they might get the idea that they're supposed to grind between chapters, and then as a result, they might make the game too easy for themselves. Uh, like, I would give this to someone and tell them, hey, don't grind. <laughs> or rather, try beating a chapter without grinding, and if you fail, then maybe go grind a little bit. Because you can do that to make it easier on yourself. You should make it easier on yourself if you're not having a good time. But I think some players might not enjoy the game becoming too easy by grinding. I've seen like one or two people on the subreddit, for example, going, Oh, um, I just trained my loot to like a level one mage knight in chapter eight. And now she's destroying everything and nothing can kill me. I thought this was a strategy game. Uh, it takes a strategizing element out of it. It does turn into, into more of a... Uh, power fantasy, self-insert, RPG, whatever you want to call it. Um, I'm just using some buzzwords here, but you know, some people enjoy watching a character just destroy everything on the map in one turn. If that's why you enjoy Fire Emblem or Power to You, if that gets you into the series, uh, that's great. Uh, but most of the games do not allow you to get this powerful uh, without repercussions. So I wouldn't do this. I would recommend the series to someone who just wants to do that. Uh, although there are a couple games that allow you to do that. So. It's like a slight caution I would give to someone. The same goes for the arena, but at least with the arena, you know it's very risky and your characters can very likely die. So you're incentivized to not overuse the arena unless you really know what you're doing, which new players don't. So uh, yeah, be cautious about grinding. I wouldn't recommend that unless you're okay with the difficulty just going down the toilet. Path of Radiance, I think is another great recommendation. Again, this one just integrates the tutorials into its into the, the already existing story. Like, yeah, it has one prologue, uh, just like FE8 where it's pretty much not a battle, but just a series of actions you're following. But it gets you familiar with the menus. I think it's not tedious for new players at all. It's a good tutorial. It uh, tells you what you need to know. And the rest of the game is easy. Like I said, I like, I like recommending easy games to new players because it's less likely to turn them off. And uh, then they'll, once they're looking for a challenge, they'll know where to find one. They can get harder difficulties or harder games. But that's secondary. For someone new to, to the series, uh, maybe new to strategy RPGs, strategy games in general, uh, it's great to start with. If they're already experienced with some like Advance Wars, then yeah, that might be a bit too easy for them, uh, but you can adjust accordingly. Uh, but generally, I think it's safer to recommend someone a new game, especially because the mechanics can be a little bit overwhelming. And FE9, uh, the enemies can barely scratch you sometimes. It's very easy to work with. Uh, and then just fantastic story, easy to understand, not a sequel, and mechanics are still like most games. There are some differences, but honestly, Path of Radiance's introduction is great because it's kind of a bridge between the GBA and the 3DS games where it has a skill system, uh, but it also has the old school structure. So, uh, excellent game all around too. Uh, I guess the main problem with FE9, of course, is that it's very expensive to get on hardware. Uh, so you're gonna have to find some alternative means. Radiant Dawn, I think we'd have to put this uh, rather low, unfortunately, uh, because it's a sequel. And I personally experienced Radiant Dawn before I experienced Path of Radiance, and I, I, I would like to think I came out fine. Um, but it's also really harsh on the player sometimes. If you play on easy mode, it's probably fine, but a lot of players getting into Radiant Dawn find it very difficult because the initial Dawn Brigade units are so bad <laughs> that they just get their butts kicked all the time. It's a little bit difficult to start off with, and then as the game goes on, it, of course, gets easier. But I think the initial hook is very important. Uh, it might be some bias here. Initially, I want to put this in C tier. I do think it's a little bit better because it is 
it has aged better than all these games down here. And, you know, even though it is a sequel, technically, you can get away with it, kind of. But it also spoils FE9 a little bit when you play it. And it's so much more satisfying to play it later. So maybe I should put it in a D tier. But I don't think it's as bad as most of these. I could maybe see it being here or here, but I'm going to put it here because I'm biased uh, towards Raining Dawn. It's one of my favorites, personally. Uh, but the fact that you constantly change armies, especially yeah, part two onwards, um, and the fact that it's very hard at first makes it difficult. But it does have a very good tutorial that you can turn off and on as you like. Uh, it does have mechanics that represent the rest of the series, and the game is fun to play, and it's very smooth. So those are factors that I think make it quite a bit better than, at the very least, better than most of the bottoms of D. But you can you can fight me on this if you like. That's okay. You can fight in the comments. Just don't fight me too hard. Uh, I think Raining Dawn is like kind of okay, but notably worse than everything above it at this. Shadow Dragon. Okay, so I know most people don't like these games. Most people don't like the DS Fire Emblems because they think they're ugly, uh, because they don't, uh, they don't have like supports. They're like Characters have like one line each, if that. Um, the animations don't look as cool as the GBA ones. Uh, the colors just kind of turn them off. Everyone just kind of looks serious in their portraits. It's a very dreary game. But, like I said, the Marth games are pretty good at introducing the mechanics to newer players. It doesn't have like rescuing and stuff, but it still has almost everything else. Um, the story it qualifies. It's not a sequel. Uh, it has a tutorial. They added a tutorial to FE3, FE1 in the remake Shadow Dragon. Uh, that is... I would say pretty good. I mean, it's not my favorite tutorial, but it works all right. And the game on the DS is very smooth. A lot of the quality of life introductions that were um, usually are get praised in later games, like the 3DS and the Switch games, was first added in Shadow Dragon. So I would say this one at least goes in B tier as a beginner player. I'm not saying it's that good of a game. I'm just saying it's reasonably good as an introduction to the series. It's not very hard on the first. Uh, time you're playing it. If you do want to get a challenge, you can of course play a harder difficulty. Although, I guess the fact that only normal mode has the tutorial is kind of annoying. I would rather have the option to play the tutorial on the harder difficulties, but I guess then the tutorial would have to be balanced around that. So, I don't know. That's just hypotheticals though. The point I'm making is it has a tutorial that's pretty good at teaching you what to do, and for that reason, it works kind of well for beginners. If they don't like the aesthetic of it, they can try something different, of course. That's why it's only in B tier. But overall, I think this is a solid introduction. New Mystery, I mean, it's a sequel. I wouldn't recommend it. Uh, but like, just like Radiant Dawn, I think this is okay. Uh, it does have like a very lengthy tutorial that you can play. It's like eight chapters um, that teach you the basics of the game as well. Some more, more advanced things. Like the prologue is just about like the, the real controls and stuff. But after that, it gets into like uh, stuff like reinforcements and stuff like that. Uh, to trading weapons around. Uh, that's like, that's stuff that most tutorials, no, they, they do it, right? But this one does it in a bit more of an advanced way. It's hard to explain unless you've actually played New Mystery, in which case you know what I'm talking about. The stuff like Cecil appearing on a map, being like, hey, I have steel weapons for everyone, so you should trade them out. And you kind of left to figure out the rest on your own. Like, hey, where do I, where do I put Cecil to get all those steel weapons to my guys as soon as possible? Um, but just like Shadow Dragon, it represents the mechanics well. Um, the game has aged well. It is a bit difficult on the harder difficulties, but on normal mode, I think you can just generally stomp everything as a veteran. So for new players, it should be just fine. And the tutorials, as far as I remember, are fairly clear. So I think FE12 is okay, other than the fact that it's a sequel to Shadow Dragon. Uh, even then, you know, the story of New Mystery itself is kind of <laughs> whatever anyway. So it, it's, it almost repeats Shadow Dragon in a lot of ways. So I don't think you're even missing out on that much if you skip Shadow Dragon and just play New Mystery. But obviously, it's nowhere near my top recommendation. I just think it's better than all the really old games uh, when it comes to getting new players into the series. Uh, again, it's a Japanese game. You have to translate patch it unless someone is already fluent in Japanese. And if someone is fluent in Japanese, there's like better games to start and with too. So obviously, I'm only putting it in C tier with like a barely passing grade. Uh, but if you want to be like, okay, everything that's not highly recommended goes in D tier, then yeah, these two both go in D tier, obviously. Uh, what do we got next? Awakening. Uh, this one introduced a lot of people in the series, so I'm going to rank it rather highly because apparently it works out for most of them. I will say that according to my criteria, it's not like the most high ranked game, but I think we can get away with throwing in an A tier with some caveats. Uh, it has a tutorial. I don't remember exactly how long the tutorials last in normal mode because I haven't played it in ages. Um, but I know like at least the prologue and the, the what's it called, the premonition 
uh, teach you the basics of it reasonably well. Uh, the, the game and the mechanics is where I think Awakening falls a little bit short sometimes because pair up is so different than what the rest of the series does, except for like Fates. And even in Fates, pair up is vastly different. Um, I think pair up might teach you some weird habits about the game. Uh, I don't like pair up much compared to just having all your units on the field. I prefer it if units are not just backpacks to other units, but actual combatants. You can have like two units that are both trained and being used full time be like paired up together, but I feel like Awakening doesn't incentivize that enough. I usually just end up having one unit in the back and one unit in the front most of the time. At least that's that's the way that I think the game pushes me and other people to play, but it, it depends, of course. And a lot of new players probably play with the way I just described earlier. So I think that is not fantastic. Other than that, though, it has like trading, weapon durability. Uh, it has the world map, which I've said before, is not super great for introducing to new players. It has grinding, which I said with Sacred Stones, I'm not super hyped on to give to new players because they might ruin the difficulty for themselves. Um, so I think the game should kind of protect the player from that possibility unless they really know what they're going into. But generally the way that FE8 and Awakening treat grinding is like, hey, you want to make your character stronger? Why don't you go do this encounter just for fun, you know? Just do it and before you know it, you've leveled up like eight times and you're way over leveled. Uh, which I think it, it helps with the power fantasy bit, uh, especially because Robin is a self-insert and some people just really like having Robin destroy everything. But if you want to have someone play a strat, if, if someone wants to play a strategy game where they have to make difficult decisions on where to position themselves, then that obviously kind of ruined that. So it really depends on what someone is looking for uh, on their first playthrough and in video games in general. And that's something you're going to have to judge if you recommend it to someone or if you're looking, this, looking at this effort for yourself to figure out what do I uh, do. So that's why I think Awakening is an A tier and not an S tier. Uh, but other than that, it kind of, you know, passes all the check marks, right? It passes all the tests. Uh, the story's not a sequel, and the game has aged well, reasonably well. It's fun. Birthright, I think, is very similar to Awakening in the sense that I don't even have to elaborate a whole lot, I think. Like, it, it gives you grinding, so be careful with that. Uh, but other than that, it has most of the mechanics and most of the controls you need. Uh, all the Fates sh games share the first, uh, I want to say, six maps. I forgot the exact count. Uh, but basically, what everyone calls a prologue. Uh, that is shared between all Fates games, and those do a good job of introducing you to all the mechanics that are both new to this game specifically, and just to Fire Emblem in general. So it's a good combination of helping new people get into the series, while also helping people that haven't played Fates, but have played other games, uh, get acquainted with what makes Fates so special. So in that sense, I think it's good. I do think it's a bit weird if you start with someone with like a game with pair-up, like Fates or Awakening, and then they get into another game, and they're like, wait, I can't pair my characters up. Like, it's such a fundamental part of these games that someone might think, oh, this is what Fire Emblem is like, but it's just what Fates and Awakening are like. That's why I'm a little bit hesitant on, on pair. Besides that, uh, it works just well. Um, Birthright is supposed to be a beginner-friendly version of Fire Emblem. This is how they marketed it, too. It's like, okay, for new players, try Birthright, or if you like Awakening a lot, uh, play Birthright. Uh, if you're a veteran of the series, play Conquest, it's more challenging. That's how they marketed it, and I think that works reasonably well. There are some, like, you know, asterisks I can put as a veteran player, but overall, I think that is a reasonable assessment of these games. Um, and for that reason, I'm going to rank Birthright over Conquest. I think Birthright goes here, and Conquest goes here, because Conquest has most of the same pros as Birthright, but it's a lot harder, and I said before, grinding is not is something you have to, like, caution people into, but it is a good out for players that are having trouble, uh, where they just want to be like, okay, I'm having so much trouble beating this map that I kind of want to give up. And instead, they have the option, oh, I can just go grind and get some extra gold or extra characters or extra um, levels on my characters, extra experience. And that way, they'll get a lot better. Um, one thing about the Fates games, of course, is that weapons do have infinite durability. And I'm not super big on that because I think managing durability is part of what makes Fire Emblem Fire Emblem. And especially the way that durability interacts with... Uh, the rest of the weapon mechanics, like how most weapons above iron are not really considered very good in, in Fates. Most veterans aren't a very big fan of how Fates handled that. But for first-time for first -time players, it's not a big deal probably, because at least if you don't have to worry about weapon durability, that's one less thing that they have to keep in mind while playing through something they're unfamiliar with. So maybe it is a blessing in disguise, but they might get tricked into thinking that silver weapons are good or something, which not something you'd want new players to do. Overall, kind of neutral on that. Uh, Rev, I mean, I can't rank this very high for anything, but uh, it's DLC. It's complementary to the other Fates games. It's not going to make a whole lot of sense to new players. 
it can probably work. I'm sure there's going to be one traumatized person in my comment section saying, hey, I played Rev first and this was my experience and I turned out okay, I think. Um, but Birthright and, and Conquest both kind of... I think you need to play one of these before you even try Rev. Uh, like, no matter your opinions on either, any of these games, um, I'm going to rank it, like, very low. I still think it's better than all these because it has the tutorial and all the other accessibility things. It has aged better. Uh, it's just I don't think Rev is very fun in general. Uh, and the story, it's, and it's not a sequel, but it really relies heavily on Birthright and Conquest for a lot of it. So uh, I'm gonna rank it very low on that. But as a Fates game, you you could do a lot better as a Fates games. But as far as like new games goes, there's still like worse ones out there. I just there's no reason to play this one first. That's the thing. Echoes, I freaking love Echoes, but I have to rank it very low. <laughs> I have to rank it very low because um. All the problems with the Gaiden has, except for the port, but it hasn't aged well. Like it, it copies Gaiden in a lot of ways. It's a, it's a remake, of course, and everything that represents Gaiden, but not the rest of the series, is kind of true for Echoes. Uh, it's just slightly better at that. You could argue this goes higher. Um, it depends on how important you think representativeness is. Uh, if you want to hook someone with, rep with presentation, for example, instead of rep representation, uh, if you want to, you know, just get someone into amazing voice acting and music and stuff like that. I can totally understand that, and if you want to rank Echoes like here, or here, or here, totally fair. I get it. I'm putting it here because I think Echoes maps are so different from what Fire Emblem is mostly, that I think it wouldn't be enjoyable, but I do love it a lot. So I kind of want to talk myself into ranking it a little bit higher. because <laughs> Not just because I like it, uh, but because Echoes is just a very well-liked game in, in general. That said, Echoes has a couple maps from Gaiden that are just such a massive slog that I wouldn't want to risk someone turning someone off. I actually have a friend who hasn't played that many Fire Emblem games and he actually didn't want to continue playing Echoes. I think because there was like one map they didn't really enjoy. Uh, also the way promotions work, I didn't really mention that, but in Gaiden uh, compared to the rest of the series, it's just so different. Like the, the difference between being able to use a promotion item to make a decision when to promote someone and just being at a shrine and being able to say, oh, I just want to promote, let's do it. And that's it. Like having to go to a location to promote someone, it just changes almost everything. Plus exploring is so different from most of Fire Emblem games. I think I can make this arguments. I just, it's this weird ranking this in the same tier as two sequels is all I'm saying. But yeah, I wouldn't recommend Echoes for a first timer. However, I think if this were a tier list for second game to play in Fire Emblem, and if you want to give someone like something slightly different once they've gotten the hang of it, this one shoots way up in value. The, the stonks for this go way up. Uh, once you've introduced someone with like one of these five games, uh, you could just give someone echoes to be like, okay, you enjoyed that, now try this, it's a little different. And then, you know, then we're talking. Uh, then we could put this in like A and S, because I would not want anyone to miss out on the experience of playing Fire Emblem Echoes Shadows of Valentia for the Nintendo PC. Uh, but I think to get into Fire Emblem, I think it's nice to experience something else first. Then we have three houses. Uh, this probably introduced the most people to Fire Emblem, at least in the modern era, out of like all games, because god it's it was so massive when it first dropped but it is very different from most games it does have tutorial at the start that teaches you again the most important basic things about fire emblem uh but it misses a couple things or rather it has a couple things that i think might change the way that someone sees the series as a whole once they've tried it uh the part with the monastery and the teaching uh the tutoring uh ranking up skills like that it's so different and this is this again i'm trying to separate this completely from the fact that it's not my favorite way to do things and i slightly dislike it and it's just the flow of three houses there's so much time between a core fire emblem gameplay um, i feel like you spend most of your time on the calendar screen or in the monastery doing stuff like that like fire emblem three houses just does not respect your time if you're looking for turn-based combat which is what most of fire emblem is about i think it's more of a slice of life simulator or a school day simulator or whatever. If you enjoy that, that's great. But in that case, I think you'd be better off with a series like Persona 5 or, you know, a series like Persona 4, you know what I mean? Uh, that's that's what most people compared Three Houses to when it first came out, is, is, is Persona. Um, so I'm not sure that if someone enjoys those aspects, they would enjoy all of Fire Emblem. And again, I want to suck people into what makes Fire Emblem Fire Emblem, so I want to give them as much Fire Emblem as possible, and everything else, I think, distracts a little bit from it. Um, that said, if you enjoy Three Houses and then you want to explore the rest of the series, that's great, but I think you're going to have to adjust your expectations from there if you do that. And that, I think, is what holds Three Houses back a little bit. So, um, that said, I'm still going to put it in A tier because clearly it has worked 
for getting people into the series. There was a huge boom in the Fire Emblem community from people checking out Three Houses. So uh, I can't knock it too hard for what it did. But uh, yeah, I think it has those flaws that I think we should uh, acknowledge. Uh, so I think there's honestly a pretty big gap between uh, the S tiers and the A tiers. Another big gap between the A and the B tiers. C and D, I think you can almost interchange in this tier list. Uh, I know there's one game missing from this tier list because it wasn't updated for Engage. Uh, I would rank Engage probably like around A or B tier as like a fine introduction with tutorials and everything. Uh, the, the fact that it's such a referential game to older games, it kind of hurts because you don't really care about who Leaf and Micaiah and Alm and... Well, not Alm, he's not in the game. Erica and stuff are if you haven't played the previous games. But at the same time, you don't really have to. It's just the game, the characters look kind of generic. Uh, but if you enjoyed Engage, you probably would enjoy the rest of the series. So I would say uh, bottom of A or above three houses roughly is probably a good spot for Fire Emblem Engage. Uh, depending on what you value and what you don't value. Um, it's a fine introduction. Uh, I would prefer something else, but that's what the other higher tiers are for. So yeah, let me know in the comments what you think. Obviously, most people watching this will probably be familiar with the series as a whole, but I'm still curious what your opinions are. So thank you for watching and uh, let me know what you think and I'll see you next time. Peace.